Theater has always been important to Czech culture, very much important to Czech identity. It was sometimes used to mask political commentary when, if you said these things too blatantly or out loud, you'd end up in a world of trouble. So to that end, I'm speaking today with Nancy Bishop, who is an Emmy-nominated casting director, CSA, who has been here in the Czech Republic for a long time, works in film and TV. Hi, Nancy. Hi. What's up? Well, I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad to be not talking about my job as a casting director, because <laughs> usually when I'm interviewed, that's it's it's that kind of thing that people want to hear about, about right. working in film, and they, actors like to listen to the tips I have, and I've written books about casting, but, but honestly, my real passion and the thing that brought me to Prague in the first place was theater, and I was a theater director, and I studied theater, and uh, I got my master's degree in Czech theater history and criticism, and so I want to share uh, the original passion that brought me here, which was um, theater and its relationship to politics. Uh, I'd like to thank Nancy for talking to me today, and I'd like to thank everybody for listening. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location... It's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. So theater is is in your blood. Yeah, I was. Um, <clears throat> I came here uh, as a theater director to direct a play for Black Box Theater. Wow. I was not one of the founders. Actually, the founders were John Farage. Uh, right. Uh, Alex Gammy, Beth Russell, and Victoria Shobris, who's now Doherty. Mm -hmm. So those uh, and and they founded. They invited me to direct a play here in 1994. So um, and I had been here already in '93. So that was. Um, but but originally my interest in this country was that I signed a petition to get Havel out of prison in '89. Uh, uh, I, I kid you not. I mean I was working in theater in Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how it worked. He sent this the petition went around to theater communities all around the world and of course we signed this petition and uh, we never I mean you sign millions of petitions when you live in America right and you never they don't really you know accomplish anything I'm pretty sure yeah, nothing yeah. happens yeah. Uh, yeah and so then the next thing we know he's not only is he out of prison but he's president of the country right so yeah. that was one of the things that hey am I here. glad I signed my name yeah yeah that. that was me I did that yeah. I was, like, I was <laughs> the signature that pushed it over the edge. right right one yeah, less yeah. signature wouldn't have happened yeah 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 no, but uh, so that was a very exciting time. And I was working at a theater. I, w I was actually one of the early members of a theater called Straw Dog, which still exists in Chicago. And we were the first to produce his plays in Chicago. We did a hmm. uh, Temptation, uh, Pokoshini in, in Czech. And uh, uh, we were the first ones to do that in Chicago. And I directed a memorandum. I was also uh, teaching drama at a school, uh, Francis Parker School. And I did that with the kids. And that was like all in the early 90s. So I was already fascinated with this country and its relationship with theater for a long time. Right. And that was one of the things that drew me here. You wrote your thesis on yes. politics and Czech theater. Yes, the Czech theater and its relationship to politics, because it's always had a very strong relation, or for a long time anyway. And in a way that I don't, like, was unparalleled in my experience of theater in the States, like I say. And yeah. that it was taken seriously and that it was, uh, it was effective, you know, as a tool uh, of change. And I think that the clearest examples of it were actually during, um, post 1620, after White Mountain, after the Czech lands were absorbed into the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Right, and, it's, and it's, you're all Catholics now. Sure. And the uh, Czech language ceased to be a literary language at that time. And there were actually major book burnings. 
Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a horrible time. And Czech became uh, regarded as this kind of, you know, peasant language. Right. So for a long time, there was absolutely no Czech spoken on the stages, except uh, it was allowed in puppet theater. You know, it, it, there's an old joke about puppetry that, you know, that you could say, the puppet could say anything he wanted about the king because the puppeteer would say, oh, I didn't say it, the puppet said it. Right. You know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but, but it's actually true. I mean, they just thought, oh, that's children's theater or whatever. But actually, uh, puppetry can be extremely subversive. And it was. And then there was also amateur theater going on in the countryside. They, you know, they, uh, on the Prague stages, it became all German theater. Right. But uh, on the countryside, you could have a Czech performance, and um, sometimes they were making fun of the aristocracy. Because what happened was the Czech aristocracy was forced out of the lands, mm. for the most part, and they were replaced by Catholic aristocracy. And there's the, there's the giant massacre on Old Town Square, too, where was it 21 nobles tried to take it all back, and they got their heads chopped off, so... Even if you if you wanted any kind of a position, you had to play ball. Right, yeah. exactly. But they would do plays where, for example, the Czech novels spoke really bad Czech, and then the kind of lower class, the like peasant type of people, spoke perfectly grammatically Czech. <laughs> and, you know, it was actually probably pretty true, because probably the nobles were probably speaking kind of bad Czech. Right, if, if they bothered. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I think that's quite funny. So that's that's subversive in mm -hmm. and of itself. But they were kind of ignoring those things. So if you can imagine, from 1620 all the way until 1771, huh. there is no record of any play in Prague on a main stage anywhere being performed in Czech until 1771, when we have this play, Kinesia Hansa, which I don't think was a particularly great play or anything. It was based on a German play. But it was performed in Czech. But the funny thing is that the, all the actors who performed it were actually kind of more... The professional actors were German. Right. So they were speaking Czech really badly. So if you can imagine, like, somebody performing in my Czech or something like that. <laughs> right. I mean, really bad. Um, the Czechs were like, hey, we'll take it. Yeah. We're not... Uh, we're not... We're not... Beggars can't be choosers. We'll, we'll take it. Right. And then... But that then became like progressively the goal of the nationalist movement. And then, of course, there, were, there was Count Nostich. Uh, he started the, well, we now call it uh, Stavovsky Dovadlo, Dovadlo of the, of the uh, Theater of the States. Yeah. Right. The funny thing about Nostich is that he wanted to start a national theater for Czechs, but he was saying, we're going to do it in our native language, German. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it reminds me, some years ago, my wife and I were on some long train trip someplace, and uh, somewhere in Germany, an old German guy got on and heard us talking. And started speaking with us, and he said, "Well, you know what the most beautiful German city in the world is? Prague." <laughs> <laughs> well, like, of well? course. <laughs> I mean, it was all part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire, and mm -hmm. German was a language here. And as we know, the street signs were in German, and all of that. And mm -hmm. so it became a real political statement to have uh, to have theater in Czech. And it wasn't really until post-1848 when there was the uprising, the first right. uprising against the, the crown, basically, when people started to become very motivated about nationalism here. Uh, kind of the late 1800s, we had this uh, playwright, Václav Tom, mm. who was the first playwright to write in Czech. His plays were performed at the Nostic Theater. And even just performing in Czech was controversial. Right. And there were Czech nobles who were saying, oh, yeah, it's a peasant language. And, mm -hmm. and, and you, you know, you actually had to get permission to do it. Mm. Uh, you had to get permission to perform in Czech. Mm -hmm. So that's how much of a, of a big deal it, it, it was. You know, it always reminds me, I always think that the Czechs and the Irish have a lot in common one of which is very literary and they, they have an influence far beyond their small size. But also Irish, like Irish was illegal for a long period of time on the streets of Dublin and in the cities of Ireland. Well, this is precisely why I brought the uh, Brian Friel's play, Translations, mm. 
to the check stage in, what year was it, 96, I think, I became so uh, fascinated with this play because it made that parallel exactly what you're talking about. Really? Yes, uh, between the hegemony of the English language over the Irish language the same way the German language had hegemony over the Czech language. and. Right. Um, so we performed that at, it was called Labyrinth then, now it's called Svandovo, Devadlo. Right. Anyway, yeah, and I think that Czechs see that too, because at the same time we were doing our English production, there was also a Czech production of it at Seletna. The first national theater, and I think a lot of people don't know this, mm-hmm. was it was before the national theater building. It was on Václavák, and it was called the Boda. Ah. And that started in 1786, and Boda means, you know, just kind of temporary structure, like a hut or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it was just this kind of you know crappy you know wood structure but people would flock to it Mm. and they would see plays in Czech and that lasted for a certain amount of time before they just kind of went bankrupt but that kind of demonstrated the the need that that Czechs really they really loved that they really loved seeing plays in their own language and so when the the Czech nationalist movement came along in the late 1800s and we had people like Polatsky and Rieger they called them the young Czechs. A very central part of their platform was like, look, we have a majority of Slavs in this country. Yeah. So let's get theater in our language. And that was a crucial part of the nationalist movement was getting the national theater established. Right, right. And when it finally was in 1880, that was all Czech funds. That was all Czech people contributing towards building that building. Mm-hmm. And, and it was just a, it was just two years later in 1882 that Charles University started allowing not just German language classes but Czech language ones as well. So it it, it was working. The Germans the German speakers who were in charge were were making way. I and guess. also they started um, encouraging and having incentives for people to write uh, plays in Czech at that time too. So um, you know, and again, this is like all over the empire. This was what it was all about. These kinds of things were happening. But it, I mean, here, as far as I know, it was the, the crucial thing was to have the theater in in the Czech language. The, the National Theater has always been linked to Czech national identity and politics. I mean, the first thing that happened there when they consecrated it was all the big guys were there, Pulaski and all those guys. And they performed The Bartered Bride, which is a very, you know, which is a Czech opera. And there was this actress named uh, Leopoldo de Stalova who read this uh, patriotic poem, Yendal, Go mm-hmm. On. And, uh, but the, the National Theater has always been a place where people have gathered at important times. So, for example, 1918, when it became a country after sure. the start, uh, the, the end of the World War I, people congregated there then. And then it was also a place where when there were uh, problems, like, for example, when the Nazis took over, they gathered all of the theater artists into the National Theater, made them sit there, this is 1942, oh. made them sit there and swear allegiance to the Reich. Like you are, and, and history repeats, it's the same darn thing. They mm. said, you are not going to perform in Czech, you're going to perform in German. God, same yeah. thing again. Like, wow, all the strides we made are, yes. are back. Uh. Can you imagine? And then it became the same thing, like under the Austrians, like performing in Czech became this political act. So even just doing like a Czech folk play or something like that. So they were pretty, you know, at the beginning they were pretty German. And then after a while, uh, there was this um, famous uh, director, Czech director, E.F. Burian, who did a dance piece called The History of Dance, where there was this very uh, despotic choreographer whipping his dancers. (laughs) And he got arrested for that. Really? Yeah. So, no words. I mean, because He's it like, was, look, it wasn't in Czech. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that was very obviously, you know, about Hitler. Right. But anyway, that history repeats itself as well of having theater artists sit down in the Czech theater and swear allegiance because it happened again in 1978 after Charter 77, which was the Human Rights Act that, I mean, that was Havel's whole thing, uh, Havel and uh, Landowski and all of those guys. There were a lot of theater people 
who signed the charter in, in, in 77. And in 78, again, the government sits everybody down in the National Theater, and then they say, okay, it's fine. We will forgive you if you sign the counter charter. Right. And if you don't sign the counter charter, you don't get to do theater anymore. Right, basically. which is where you get uh, you get things like what was known as uh, apartment theater or flat theater. Sure. People doing theater like in their flats. And in pubs. and Well, that's jumping ahead. But yeah, uh, Havel, Landowski, all of those guys. That, and they did one. There was one production of Beggar's Opera, for example. And the government thought, oh, that's just John Gay's, you know, like 1700s. It's like, who cares? Let them do it. But it was Havel's. Beggar's Opera. Right, it's and his version. the yeah. STB actually <laughs> went to it, and everybody who did that got arrested. That was at, that was out in the country at some pub somewhere. Really? And they and, showed up anyway. Yeah, uh, and everybody got arrested for that. Or there was a, there was a theater called Divadlo Natahu, uh, yeah. Divadlo, a theater on the pole, which was an amateur theater, and they would perform his stuff. And his brother, Ivan, was a part of one production, which was, um, they filmed, actually. And it was kind of like Sami's Dot. I mean, Sami's Dot, if anybody knows what that is, it's when they would write texts on carbon paper and, and pass it around and sneak it out of the country. And So this was kind of com- uh, Sami's Dot film slash theater because they filmed the play and they put it on video and then they kept copying the video so i saw one of the videos and it was copied over like seven times or whatever it was awful it was everybody's grainy. face is just a cube yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> right and his brother ivan was in that and so that was like kind of a anyway it was underground is yeah. the point it was underground and then of course his plays were performed in vienna and new york and other plays. they could be performed um in other countries just not here but not here But going back, so obviously we all know what happened to the Nazis. You know, they didn't last. They just didn't and have stick to itiveness. No. <laughs> they just didn't. They just couldn't follow through, man. But they did. They, the point is, they did the same thing that the Austrians did. Like, no, 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 Czech, German. Mm-hmm. And then, so there were a few years, uh, for anybody who knows Czech history, there were a few years where the Czechs were on their own after the Germans left, and then they made the mistake of voting in communism. God fall. God <laughs> and it didn't turn out to be a great choice. Well, it was a great choice for some people. Yes, that's true. Some people, some people benefited quite, quite well. That's true. And there were many left-wing theater artists, including Voskovitz and Varek, who mm. were uh, you know, popular artists at the time. And they were cool guys. And you know, I can understand why communism seemed like a good idea to a lot of people at mm. the time. And at that time, when communism came in, there was this thing called the theater statute. Ah. Which said that socialist realism should be the main vehicle of theater. and Very much in the Soviet wheelhouse, of aesthetically. Of course, yeah. yes. But there were good things about the theater statute. And what they were was that they elevated local theater. Because communism recognized theater as such an essential tool for educating, they said, okay, look, all the theaters in the country... and everywhere, the amateur theaters, the puppet theaters, everything, we are going to fund it. Oh. So that seemed good, oh, right? Yeah, okay. And yeah. you know what? I have to say, when I came here in the early 90s, coming from a place where theater is was so poorly funded... Yeah, it's, con- it's a constant struggle. Constant struggle. I was very impressed with how many theaters were in Czech. Well, I mean, my God, walking around... I'm, I've tried to get a number. I can't get anybody to give me an accurate number, but there are... I mean, there are hundreds of theater spaces in this city. Hundreds. Yeah, but I I think that it's gone down. I mean, under communism, theater was like a real source of employment for people. Sure. And they paid everybody. They paid the coat check lady. They paid all the people who made the props, who made the sets, of course, the actors, the directors. And um, I was just so impressed with that when I first came to check how Mm -hmm. many theaters there were. Mm -hmm. And so that was obviously, of course, it was a popular decision for for some people who can then make their 
their living on mm -hmm. theater. And they professionalized puppet theater. Do you realize this country was the first place where there was a professional puppetry department? Yeah, I, I, I've always heard it was the Drak Theater in Hradec Kralova, basically. Um, yeah, this is where puppet theater kind of is more than just, it's not Punch and Judy, it's far more complicated. Well, yeah, Joseph Krafta was the artistic director at Drac, and he was the head of the puppetry department at um, Charles University. Sadly, he's passed. But anyway, so that was obviously a popular decision. Sure. We at Black Box, the theater company that I ran for a in while. The, in the 90s. In the 90s. Mm. Um, we found one of these old plays. Really? Yes, and it was ha. called... Um, Parta Brusitsa uh, Karhana, and th this literally translates as the workers who grind under Karhan, <laughs> which Jeez. we decided to call Karhan's men. Um, and <laughs> we thought that, the that workers whole, yeah. who grind under Karhan was not, didn't have a ring to it. Didn't quite yeah. work. But anyway, my friend Victoria translated it. Victoria, she's now Victoria Doherty. Um, she was a Victoria Schobers. But she um, was somebody who uh, was smuggled, was defected from Czechoslovakia to America in her mother's womb. Uh -huh. And so she grew up speaking Czech, but like kitchen Czech, you know? Right, right. Um, And so she had, her grandmother helped her a lot with translating it because it was written in this, it was a lot of like workers' dialect. Uh, the goal of the play was to um, inculcate that both the city workers and the country kind of, let's say, peasants for lack of a better word, you know, the farmers, whatever, um, the real people. Yeah, under communism. Right. And then, of course, obviously, sometimes the people making the theater decide, well, we're just going to sneak some stuff in and see see if we get away with that. Well, yeah, I think at that time they weren't so much doing it. It wasn't until after Stalin's death right, everybody that things felt like they could really breathe. changed. And that's when the statue came down, you know, the statue yeah. of Stalin and all of that came down. And so what that meant for theater was there was a shift. And so then characters uh, became victims of ideology rather than mouthpieces of ideology. And that's, of course, when young Havel came in and he was, uh, you know, he's a props manager at the theater and then he was a dramaturg and he was writing. Basically what Havel said was every act of free will was uh, political. So his plays weren't necessarily overtly well. political. <laughs> but what he was known for was at that time, plays from the West started to seep in. And as we know, there was a loosening and, you know, in the, the 60s, like b before the Prague Spring and all of that, it was a freer time mm -hmm. and we had dupe jack and all of that so uh at that time you even had plays like waiting for godot by beckett coming in enesco's play coming in all these absurdist dramas and um the czechs would kind of watch it and go oh that's our life <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's eerily familiar. Right, that's right. uncomfortably familiar. <laughs> and so Havel's genius was that he took this absurdism, but he placed it in a more realistic context. Mm. So you had a play like, for example, The Memorandum. Which I, I, I like that It's play. a great play. I love that play. It, it's absurdism, but it's placed in an office where people yeah. work. And so there's this character, Gross, who he just goes to work one day, and they tell him, oh, like, we're all learning this different language. We're going to start. And it's like in a totally impossible to learn language. Right, because it's, it's, the, it's the perfect bureaucratic language, and because it's bureaucratic, it's constantly being changed. So by the time you think you've mastered some section of it, oh, no, that's out. Right. It's a new section now. <laughs> right, that was called podiatry, and that was yeah. uh, originated by Ivan Havel, by Václav's brother. Mm. But that was the whole thing, was that he put it in a realistic context and it was all about the alienation of the individual. And that was his genius as a playwright. Mm -hmm. And so he was performing that at NASA Broadly and that was going on. And um, that all crashed down in 68, of yeah. course, when we had Russian tanks coming through and they decided they just couldn't quite deal with all of the liberties that the Czechs were taking. Yeah. So then that was a very dark period, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, in the 70s and 80s. They called it normalization. Yeah, and which so, is such a bureaucratic term. Well, it, <laughs> but it was in the sense that a lot of, uh, a lot of Czechs just capitulated, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think we all would like to think that we would have been brave. You know, I always wonder what would I have done? What would I have done? Would I have you know, risked my life and my ability to go to the school I wanted and my ability to travel and right. would I have played the game or 
would I have stood up to totalitarianism? And we all like to think that we would have, but it was very hard. I mean, the people who stood up to the regime, you know, they ended up shoveling coal and sweeping floors or, and cleaning Or radium in Yakimov if, if they were really in trouble. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, especially for an, uh, uh, Americans, I think it often seems like, oh, a bunch of cowards. But it's not that. It's that, look, man, it's, the, oh, it's coming around again. We got the boot on the neck again. And I guess we just gotta, we just gotta get through it. And then who knows what will happen. You know, Havel was, it was definitely encouraged to leave the country. I mean, a lot of people left. Oh yeah. And Landowski, Pavel Landowski was another uh, dissident actor. He was in all of Havel's plays and he uh, he left, you know. As we know, Kundera left. A lot mm-hmm. of people left. They wanted Havel to leave because he was a troublemaker. They encouraged right. him to leave, but he just refused to. <laughs> There's leave. the door. Yeah. It's open. No, he Here's just, a visa. <laughs> he just honestly felt like this was his country. He needed to be here, mm. and as we know, he wrote all these open letters to the government and uh, you know this is what makes me crazy is when people say something like well it doesn't matter because I live in Texas so I can't vote or if I vote it doesn't matter or my senator won't listen to me because he's Republican and it just it makes me crazy because I'm like well Havel was living under a freaking you know totalitarian government and he fought it (laughs) you know and And he went to jail and he went to jail he did and uh, and this was I mean this was he was was really a big catalyst in, in me coming here, as mm-hmm, I say, because mm-hmm. um, I just admired him so much and what he accomplished. And and then, of course, uh, the next big moment was uh, in 89. Right. Big and, surprise. Yeah. And here we have a playwright um, catapulted to the head of the movement. Yeah. And he was the spokesman for the movement. Because when uh, would, do you for, know when, when when was he released from prison? It was eighty nine. I mean, it, it was, was that year. So he was yes. like, "Wow, it's really nice to be free. What's going on?" Yes, it was November of eighty nine. He was still in prison, and uh-huh. then it was this. It, I mean, of course, the winds were blowing the other way. We know that, right. you know, and we know that the Soviets were essentially ready to let go of their satellites because they couldn't support them anymore. And, hmm. Yeah, so he was released from prison, and then he started going to these protests and everything. And uh, yeah, next thing you know, he's the president. Yeah. The um, cell, let's call it, for the revolution was at Laterna Magica, which is a theater. Mm-hmm. And they were, at the time, there was a production of Ionesco's um, The Rhinoceros, and there, there was this huge, like, mouth, you know, jaw, <laughs> and they actually held their meetings within this jaw, That's the jaw funny. of the rhinoceros. Now, I thought I thought it was that um, they also had some meetings at um, Bezabradli in Palazzo Adrio. That could be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know that they for sure were doing it in La Terna Magica, right. but, but actually they were doing it in all theaters because what happened was that... Um, uh, among the people who boycotted going to work were the th- uh, the theater students uh-huh. and the, the all theaters at that time in 89 they said we're not going to play and people would get to the theater and they'd say okay we're going to talk and they'd have what, ah. what I would call town hall meetings, you know, that's an American term, but basically they'd just sit down and they'd have uh, discussions. So mm. the, the theater became a place of uh, political action and, and uh, discussion. But as you, as you pointed out, I mean, there was this whole game that was played. Um, like, for example, the critics, they helped the theater survive because what they would do is they'd go to the theater and they would give a kind of official... Um, interpretation of it which they'd print in the newspaper right. they'd say oh okay this is marxist theater because and they'd spin it you know they com- in a certain commie way. wash they call me what you'd say. And then, and then the people who were there, they knew how to read between the lines. And they'd say, oh, uh-huh. I see what this was. And I, you mentioned this theater earlier, Divadlo Drac and Radas Kralove. They were a puppet theater, but they were doing incredibly subversive stuff. Mm. And the government, they kind of knew about it. I mean, they weren't stupid. I think when you do a play called The Dragon, and it's about a totalitarian dragon, and you're like, they got it, you know. But they would even let that play travel. And hmm. here's the irony. They would travel it, even to, I think they even toured in the States, and the communist um, official would say, would say, see, we we have freedom of speech here. There's freedom. Yeah. yeah. The 
the arts have always been very important here. Theater has always been at the forefront of Czech identity. And uh, a lot of it's because of the language. A lot of it's because of their history. Well, a super interesting conversation, Nancy. Thank you for talking to me. Thanks for letting me talk about it. Yeah, so, (laughs) so interesting. And now it's time for a beer. Thank you for listening. Right on. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times.